um, to the Science CSE 2023 public event, organized, of course, by the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics. My name is Thierry Dekel, and I'll be the host for this evening. Uh, this morning, I was uh, on radio uh, talking about this event together with uh, Professor Rose Silvers, one of the organizers of this uh, uh, event. And the last few days, the people from this radio program have asked me what is the importance of mathematics? And to be honest, I, I somewhat struggle with this question, not because it's difficult to find areas where math is important, but it's, it's quite the contrary. Math is everywhere. Um, it is so ubiquitous that it's, it's almost like asking the question, what is the importance of language? Um, you can't do anything without language. Our whole society, our thinking, our ways of being are based on language. And it would be impossible to live the lives that we live here today without it. And I think it's pretty much the same for mathematics. Engineering, natural sciences, they all try to make sense of nature. From physics, chemistry, and biology, all the way up to applied sciences where people try to make bridges and buildings and understand our society. We try to understand nature, understand her rhythm, understand what causes what. And for this, we need a language that can accurately describe rhythm, cause and effect, and understand the language of nature, and, and that is mathematics. The phones in your pockets communicate via wireless waves. And these things were thought up by a Scotsman in the 19th century with the use of math. He thought about waves of electromagnetism and discovered that light and, and radio waves are pretty much the same thing. And then uh, somebody else, Heinrich Hertz, uh, tried to make them in real life. And, and then later Marconi thought, you know, let's build the radio. It's a bit more difficult than that, but that's sort of the, the, the gist of it. So, with maths we can model things, we can play with systems, we can mimic situations and adjust our models precisely in the way that we want and we can see what our adjustments will probably do in real life. Without maths there would be no economics, no physics, very little chemistry, we would not use the internet, modern telecommunication, have self-driving cars, we would not use computers, nor could we make them? Everything we use has a connection somewhere with math or mathematicians. So if you're not one, look around. They're here. We can solve medical problems, prove whether medicine works or not. We can plan the arrival of packages, and we can even optimize the queues at Seattle Airport. Well, not the best example, but theoretically we could do something like that. Applied maths is a tool. We, we as people, companies, governments, NGOs, and municipalities have the option to use math for good or for bad. It is a crowbar that makes things happen. And that's why it's everywhere. And we better use it to open doors, for instance, to burning buildings so that we can extinguish the fires inside. According to Deloitte, who got deep in the numbers, well, there you go, math, they say mathematics is responsible for some 30% of our gross domestic value. That is how importantly vital mathematics is. Big problems await us with climate change, energy transition, artificial intelligence, much more exciting fields and subjects where we need mathematics. So yes. It is sometimes difficult for me to correctly convey how important maths is. It is the language of nature, of optimization, of cause and effect. And we need this crowbar to better the world. Today we are lucky to have some of the best speakers who can tell us all about the importance of mathematics within these big societal problems. And so enjoy this evening, and let's start with our first speaker of this evening, and that is Professor Karen Rokas. And she is a very experienced researcher in computational science, worked at Boeing, MIT, and now at the Odin Institute of the University of Texas.
that she's renowned for her work on modeling and simulating aircrafts and other complex engineering systems. Using mathematical methods as a sound base for her work, she is very, very, uh, um, very uh, uh, well versed in reducing extremely large problems into a feasible size. And that is something that the world needs now more than ever. She will speak about digital twins, a very hot topic in the industry and the medical world. And luckily, she's here to explain to us uh, what they are. So please, give a big round of applause for Karen Wilcox. All right, uh, well, it's great to be here tonight. And uh, tonight, I want you to join me a little bit in imagining the future. But before we start imagining the future, I want to take a little dive into the past. And I want to take you back. The button works. Here we go. Uh, I want to take you back to the Apollo program in the 1960s and the 1970s. So back in the Apollo program, when NASA would launch a spacecraft into space, they would also launch a simulator that would stay on the ground in Houston. And the simulator on the ground in Houston would mirror the spacecraft up in space and it would follow along in the mission. Uh, so this became very important during the Apollo 13 mission. And maybe many of you have seen the movie and so you know the story that during the Apollo 13 mission, the spacecraft suffered a malfunction uh, was badly damaged, and it became stranded up in space. And so the story goes that NASA were able to take data from the physical spacecraft stuck up in space. They were able to take that data and feed it into the simulator on the ground in Houston to dynamically adapt the simulator so that now its properties that reflected the, the damaged spacecraft that was stuck up in space. And then they were able to use that dynamically adapted simulator to run scenarios, to play the what-if questions, and to inform the decisions that ultimately brought the astronauts back home safely. So I want you to think about that amazing story, and think about the different elements in that story. So first of all, there were models at play, and the models in this particular story uh, was a physical simulator on the ground in Houston. Then there were data in that story. And the data were uh, the data that were collected from the sensing systems on board the spacecraft as well as from observations that the astronauts were making. So there were models and there were data. And then when things got really interesting was when those two things were put together. And those two things, models and data being put together, happens through a process that mathematically is known as data simulation. So the idea that you have a model, in this case a simulator on the ground, that you can take data from a physical system and bring that data into the model and change the model so that now the model is updated to reflect changing properties of the physical system, data assimilation. So this notion of data assimilation is very powerful because data assimilation is really what lets you personalize the model. It lets you personalize the model to a particular system, in this example, uh, to the spacecraft that was up there in space, and it lets you personalize the model to the dynamic situation that's taking place. And that then brings us to the fourth element, the element of prediction. Because we have now a personalized model, we can make predictions that are tailored to the particular situation that is at hand. So I want to bring you back now uh, to the present day, so let's come back to 2023. And Today, that story of models and data and data assimilation has been revolutionizing the way that we design and operate engineering systems. Now, the story is similar to the Apollo story, the Apollo 13 story, but it also has some differences. So if we start with the data, uh, I probably don't have to tell you that we're living in the era of big data. So we have more data now than ever before about our, our engineering systems. Uh, particularly as sensors have become cheaper, uh, more lightweight, more energy efficient, and just generally more powerful. So we have uh, a lot of data. We have models. So the models in the Apollo example, that, those models were that physical simulator on the ground in Houston. The models that we engineers have today are virtual simulators. 
Then it's the models of powerful computer models. And those computer models are built uh, from mathematical models, the mathematical models that we just heard about. Those are models that encompass the governing laws of nature, the rules that describe and tell us how systems respond. So rules like Newton's laws of motion, the familiar F equal MA from your uh, high school physics class. So models and data, and just like in the Apollo example, we can think about putting the models and the data together by data assimilation to personalize those models, to make them dynamically evolving so that they're following along uh, with the physical systems that they are representing. So this notion today, this notion of a personalized model that's dynamically evolving, is uh, what we call a digital twin. So what is a digital twin? It's a personalized, dynamically evolving set of virtual models that represent a physical system. And uh, what we see here is a picture of the aircraft that I have in my research group, so it's an unmanned aircraft. And when we think about building a digital twin of this aircraft, it's really important to recognize that we're not building a general set of models for any aircraft that looks like this. We're building a set of models that represent this particular aircraft, the one that right now is parked in my uh, garage back in Austin, Texas. And what's more, this digital twin, these models of my aircraft are not static, but they're living models, so that when my aircraft flies, we can collect data from the sensors on board the aircraft, or when we do inspections, we can collect more data based on our inspections. And then as my aircraft ages and degrades and gets damaged and gets repaired and gets maintained, I can feed all that data, I can assimilate that data into the models so that the digital twin is following the aircraft through its life. And so now I want you to imagine, uh, imagine that you own a fleet of these unmanned aircraft, a fleet of these drones, and imagine that you had a digital twin for every one of the aircraft in your fleet. Uh, and let's imagine that, I don't know, you use the fleet of drones to deliver packages, or maybe you use the fleet of drones to survey farms, or to survey low-lying coastal areas. So this <coughs> digital twin, so a digital twin for every aircraft in your fleet, you could imagine making optimized decisions about which aircraft to send out for which mission on any given day, or when to maintain a given aircraft, or maybe when it's time to retire a particular aircraft and buy a new one. So you can see that this idea of a digital twin is a really powerful decision-making uh, tool. So the name digital twin, the term was coined in 2010 uh, in a report from NASA. And in the decade or so since then, this idea of a digital twin has seen a lot of development, uh, especially in aerospace engineering. And we've seen uh, a number of great successes especially in structural health monitoring and predictive maintenance for aircraft and aircraft engines. But as I'm sitting, uh, as you're sitting there and you're listening to me, maybe you're wondering, does this notion of a digital twin have other applications? Does it have applications outside of uh, aerospace engineering? And the answer is a resounding yes. So we're already starting to see digital twins for things like bridges and roads, uh, for predictive maintenance around cities. We're starting to see digital twins of buildings to help with energy efficiency. Uh, we're seeing digital twins of wind farms to help minimize downtime and increase efficiency of the wind farm. Uh, we're not seeing it yet, but there's a lot of interest in digital twins for advanced manufacturing processes, uh, thinking about how to really optimize and control future manufacturing. Uh, again, it's not a reality yet, but uh, a lot of interest in digital twins of space systems and in fact a digital twin of Earth orbits to manage the growing uh, space jump problem. And then in our natural world, there's a lot of interest in digital twins for farms, forests, oil reservoirs, coastal regions, uh, ice sheets, oceans, even talk of a digital twin for planet Earth, all to help guide sustainable decision making. And then finally in the medical domain, uh, again, a lot of interest in digital twins to support medical assessment, diagnosis, personalized treatment, uh, in silico drug trials for a vast range of different applications within medicine, uh, with just two examples being in oncology, so for cancer patients, and in, uh, in cardiology, so for heart, heart, heart patients. 
So this is really exciting, and as I give all these examples, I'm sure you can imagine just, you know, what would I do if I had a digital twin? Wouldn't it be great? Uh, wouldn't it help me make decisions in so many different ways? But I wouldn't want you to leave the talk tonight thinking that all of this is a reality today, and I wouldn't want you to show up to your doctor tomorrow and ask uh, the doctor to give you your, your digital twin, because uh, we still can't do all this today. It's still beyond reach to have a digital twin of a full aircraft with all the physics and all the systems that are involved. Uh, it's still beyond reach to have a digital twin of an Antarctic ice sheet. It's still beyond reach to have a digital twin of a cancer patient. And so I want to talk just a little bit about why it's so difficult and why it's still beyond reach to have digital twins of these uh, complex systems. So there are a number of reasons uh, that relate to the complexity and the scale of all of these systems where digital twins can be so powerful. And uh, one real challenge are the, the number of scales that these systems cross. So if you think about my aircraft wing, we know that changes uh, in the material properties at the microscopic level can translate across scale to have an impact at the whole vehicle level. And similarly, when we start to think about medical applications, so think about a, a tumor in a cancer patient, again, we know that changes at the cellular and the molecular level translate across scales and have uh, impact at the scale of the full human patient. So those are spatial scales, many, many, many different spatial scales. And think also about the, the scales in time, the temporal scales. We may need to predict changes or model changes that are taking place in a tumor, changes that take place on the order of minutes or uh, maybe even seconds. But at the same time, we have to be able to simulate out for many months or even years for a cancer patient. Even with today's supercomputers, simulating systems across all those spatial scales and across all those temporal scales is something that we just can't do. So the models are just too expensive. That's beyond reach. So then you might say, okay, well, the models are too expensive. What about all the data? Why don't we just build digital twins from all the data we have? So yes, we have a lot of data. I talked about living in the era of big data. But when it comes to these complex challenges, these complex systems in engineering, in the natural world, and in medicine, the data are almost always sparse, noisy, and indirect. And by indirect, what I mean is, that as an engineer, I can almost never measure exactly what it is I want to know. I almost always am taking measurements on the outside of the aircraft wing and then trying to infer what's going on in the inside. The same is true in medicine. The measurements are sparse, they're noisy, and they're indirect. Measurements from the outside, trying to guess, trying to infer what's going on in the, in the inside. Maybe that will change in the future as sensors get better. Uh, I believe the data will always be sparse in these applications. But even if you could know everything about what is happening right now with the system, it's still not enough. Because remember, we need these digital twins to predict the future. And uh, all the data in the world about what's happened in the past will not tell you, for a complex system, what will happen in the future, not with the levels of confidence we need to make decisions where people's lives are really at stake. So this is uh, a huge set of challenges, uh, but there's some hope. There's a great deal of hope, and the hope really is uh, brought to us by mathematics. So this is where mathematics has an incredible role to play in addressing these challenges and in terms of and in making digital terms of reality. So I want to take you back to uh, what, where I started earlier with this notion of a mathematical model. A mathematical model that encodes governing laws of nature, it encodes the rules that let us predict how these complex systems will respond. A mathematical model is what lets me predict how the aircraft wing will respond depending on how I fly the airplane. It will let me predict how a tumor will grow or how it might respond to different treatments. Uh, it will let us predict how an ice sheet might uh, evolve under different global temperature scenarios. So we have these powerful mathematical models that we can write down in the language of mathematics. Then we need to take those models, take those mathematical models, and turn them into something that we can solve to issue those predictions. That's where the numerical methods come into play, and that's what then gives us a numerical model that we can solve on a supercomputer. 
We bring in the data, we think about the data and that data assimilation process that lets now our numerical models, our virtual simulators evolve and track along with the physical or the natural world. And then we wrap all of that in a loop of decision making. So when we look at the elements uh, on this picture here, this is the field of computational science and engineering, sometimes called CSE. This is the field uh, that brings us here today, the science conference on computational science and engineering that really encompasses uh, all, of, all of these things. So it's important to recognize that it's computational science, uh, which is distinct from computer science. The two fields have got some overlap, but computational science and engineering as a field is really different from computer science because it has at its, at its core that notion of a mathematical model that lets us predict and reason about complex physical and natural uh, systems. Okay, so if I had 15 more minutes, but I don't because it's also going to pull me off the stage, uh, I would tell you about all the incredible advances that have been made in the field of computational science and engineering over the past decades. The advances that have gotten us here today to the point that we can start to think about digital twins for all those examples I gave as being a reality. But that's just the beginning. We're really only just getting started. Uh, as I said earlier, we have some great success stories to digital twins. We have many, many open challenges. And those challenges are things that will be addressed by advances in all the different mathematical and computational topics that you see up here on this picture, uh, both individually and also uh, across and, and through, their, through their integration. Digital twins really, truly are a scientific grand challenge that's going to build our next generation of mathematical modeling and computational science to, uh, to achieve uh, impact on the world. So as a closing thought uh, for each of you in the audience today, at some point in your life, if it hasn't already, a digital twin will have an impact, will have a positive impact on your life. It will either come through uh, making the natural or the engineered world around you better, or maybe it will come through improvements in the engineering products that you consume, or maybe it will come through an improved <coughs> medical outcome uh, for you as an individual at some point in your life. And so when that happens, and when you think, oh, I wonder if there's sort of a digital, digital twin under the hood uh, making those things happen, I hope you will think back to my talk and you will appreciate the mathematics and the computational science that has made all that happen. Thank you for your attention, and I really look forward to uh, maybe chatting with some of you after the event. Thank you.
uh, especially when we're talking about uh, situations where humans are affected. How are we there yet? We are British. I mean, that's a complex situation. So, in, in some situations we're there, or we're almost there, and in other situations it's, it's I would say, we're further. Uh, when it comes to uh, structures, bridges, the structure of an aircraft, I would say we're further along than we are in other, other examples. Uh, when it comes to something like the cancer patient, there I think we're only just getting started. You know, our, our community's ability to take those mathematical models, even the mathematical models for many medical applications are not yet well characterized or well understood. And then the challenge of simulating across all those scales, Similarly, the data, the data are so sparse and so, so noisy and so indirect. Sure. So they're, they're I think, we're further. Thank um, you so much. Certainly, everybody can leave yeah. tonight feeling very safe about the bridges they're going to cross. Absolutely. The cars they're going to drive, the airplane you're going to fly in women. Because the engineers will take that very seriously. And that is all thanks to you. Professor Barry Wilcox, thank you so much. Um, called uh, Martin Schwantes, and he's an expert in statistics, uh, founded his own company in Sweden, but after a career in academia, he gradually moved into the world of mathematical biology and bioinformatics. Um, he was uh, a department head at the Institut Pasteur in Paris and moved to uh, Genentech in California before coming back to Paris, where he's now the general manager at the Institut um, they are making detailed and massive measurements on living systems, which, in combination with system biology models, have revolutionized the understanding of some fundamental processes. Um, this talk is called, uh, entitled In Control of Life, and that is something I look very much forward to. So please, give a big round of applause to our Amanda Sontes. Uh, thanks, and... Uh... Good evening. So here you see uh, an image uh, of uh, three cytotoxic killer T cells. They are surrounding and attacking a tumor cell in the middle. And I will return to this situation and I will uh, tell you a little bit of why is it, it, it is important to understand and uh, be able to control a situation uh, like this. But first, control. So, in order to be able to have any idea about control, we have to uh, be able to make maybe some predictions, or even about the future, which is hard. Or even influence the future. And for that, we need uh, models. And of course, um, uh, what is a model, right? Uh, if you're a biologist, you might think about something like this. Uh, that is uh, an animal model, uh, an in vivo system, where you can study some aspects of some biology that you might be interested in. But if you're a mathematician, you will think maybe of some system of equations or some other type of mathematical model where there are parameters that you need to estimate or fit according to measurements that you make on the system you're interested in. Uh, of course, um, more uh, advanced, or let's say more, uh, during the last decade, there has been a lot of efforts into ex vivo systems, like this organoid system here. So organoids are 3D structures, biological structures that you can build that can mimic, for instance, a human tissue. So having many of the same cells that you see in the human tissue present and functional for days or weeks or months. And we can try out, for instance, different drugs and see how this uh, tissue responds. And that is, of course, important because a mouse is a mouse. And if we are interested in biomedicine, we want to understand how humans would react to, to an intervention or, or a drug. And uh, drug development uh, traditionally goes uh, that first we try things in vitro, so we have cell lines where we try different uh, medications or drugs. Uh, we think about it, work on it, and then we move that into an in vivo phase where we maybe try it out on mouse models 
and see how that works, and then maybe move it even further into other uh, animal models before we ultimately maybe test a few of these things that cross all these uh, 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 difficult uh, <laughs> phases that we ultimately can then uh, try on humans, right? And of course, more often than not, what works in a mouse does not work in a human. Sometimes it does, but more often than not, it doesn't. Uh, and, and on the other hand, uh, you might imagine that things that we stop because it does not work in a mouse might have worked differently in a human. And of course, therefore, uh, things like organoids are important. And it's important to try to integrate all these different types of models and make them talk to each other so that we, what we learn in a computational model or mathematical model can be fed over to what we then learn in an ex vivo system uh, like an organoid. So ultimately, the, arguably the best model for human health and disease is human health and disease. This is the grand truth. Uh, what is a human? I mean, uh, the latest estimates are that each and every one of us, we, we are composed of 30 trillion human cells, 30,000 billion, 3 times 10 to the power of 13, if you prefer, human cells. On top of that, uh, we have as many bacteria in our body, around 10 times as many viruses in our body as we sit here, we stand here, and this is under normal, healthy conditions, right? And it's very dynamic. During my 15-minute talk here, I will have almost 4 billion of my human cells will die on stage. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, almost as many will be born. And this is only telling you a little bit about the, 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 their dynamics here. All these living entities in our bodies, they, uh, uh, they respond to the rise and the fall of the sun, the circadian rhythm. There is, there is periodicity here, until ultimately, of course, in the end, everything collapses. Uh, and there are many different uh, scales, of course. If you, if you look at a human cell, it's tiny. It's around 10 to 50 micrometers. A bacterial cell is much smaller. It's 10 times smaller in length. That's 1,000 times smaller in volume. A viral particle, on the other hand, is 10 times smaller still. 1,000 times smaller still in volume. Okay. So, and then all of these living entities in, in our body, they, they, they uh, signal to each other. They talk to each other all the time, constantly. They are individual living entities, right? And they send out molecules, small molecules or, or larger molecules like RNA and DNA and protein. That are, are human cells, they have proteins sticking out on their surface and they shake hands with each other and that triggers uh, programs, uh, internal programs in the cell, and sets it off in different, in different directions. And this happens all the time. So, uh, in order to, let's say, model uh, a human, we need to uh, respect all the different layers here. How molecules, billions of molecules that makes up cells, and, and then uh, all of these cells that makes up tissues and tissues that organize into organs, that organize into organ complexes, that organize into uh, an individual, and we organize into populations, and we interact with other organisms. And often, if we want to understand what, ha what is happening to an organism, a human, for instance, under a certain condition, we need to integrate information from many of these different layers in order to have a chance to have any solid predictions. Now, all our human cells, the nucleus, they contain the same DNA. And the DNA, as you know, is a recipe for, uh, that is, is being transcribed to RNA, that's being translated to proteins, and proteins, they are doing all the interesting stuff, all the action that goes on in life are, is, are done by proteins, right? 
and still they may have the same recipe inside. So why do they look different under a microscope? For instance, we have uh, bone cells and fat cells and neurons, neural cells, etc. They all look different and they have different activities. And that is because they talk to each other all the time, and they talk to each other during development. They respond to their environment during the development from a naive little cell to mature cell doing its stuff. Right? So the parts of the DNA is shut down, and some other parts are activated, and that makes uh, all different families of proteins that, that are responsible for having those, those different cells, like immune cells. So, uh, of course, we have all these viruses and bacteria, etc., inside us under normal con healthy conditions. But sometimes uh, we get uh, infected by foreign pathogens, but we have a defense. So billions of white blood cells, immune cells, are circulating in our blood and in our lymph system, and they are continuously guarding us. They are looking for these intruders, viruses, or bacteria that could, that could come, and the first responders is the innate immune system. So neutrophils and mac macrophages and dendritic cells that immediately come minutes or just not an hour after an infection, they are there to engulf and maybe eradicate the, the infection. But they are also sending off warning signals to the adaptive immune system, the T cells and B cells, that are highly specialized and that can come into action if, if needed. And they clonally expand and they are trained to, to, to hit a specific pathogen. And after they have successfully eradicated uh, that pathogen, there's memory with T cells and B cells. So next time we experience the same pathogen, we are in a better situation. So let us come back to this. This is not, uh, uh, this is not a, a, an external invader that, that messes us up. This is our own cells that go wrong. So in cancer, uh, a cell is normally mutated, and this mutation leads to prolification that is unnatural. So it, it grows more than it should, and continues to divide and grow and form a tumor. But uh, that is due to a defect, a mutation, and that mutation shows also on the surface of the cell in terms of proteins that look slightly different. And actually, this is what the T cells should see, and they should then eliminate and kill those foreign cells. There is a model for this, the cancer immunity cycle, and uh, this you should read as number one down there, release of cancer cell antigens. If a, a, a tumor starts growing, there will be cancer cells dying. Then the innate immune system will see them. They will pick them up, the dendritic cells, cancer antigen presenting cells, move them to the lymph nodes where the T cells are sitting ready to, to uh, recognize their particular antigen, if they do so, they clonally expand, they build an army of exact identical twins that then can move in the bloodstream to the tumor, infiltrate the tumor, and kill the tumor cells. And this will then uh, eliminate the cancer. And this uh, works under normal condition, but sometimes it doesn't. And then the cancer forms, and the cancer continues to grow. And over the last decade, uh, we have a new tool to fight uh, cancer. We have immunotherapy. So the Nobel Prize in 2018 was awarded for something called the checkpoint inhibitors. And checkpoint inhibitors are again molecules uh, sticking, uh, let's say checkpoints are molecules sticking out on tumor cells and on T cells that shake hands, and by shaking hands, uh, the attack of this T cell is shut down. And the idea by Honjo and Allison was that we can block this signal. And they developed uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies that could bind and actually stop this interaction would then have the effect that T cells could do their work and kill the tumor cell. And this has transformed cancer care. So for some patients, that before uh, cancer and immunotherapy, they, there were no options left. They were terminally ill. They are now cured. Unfortunately, it does not work for all uh, uh, patients. 
And the big holy grail now in cancer immunotherapy is to understand why it works for some patients and why it doesn't work for other patients. So uh, response and resistance to, to, to therapy. And what we have in our toolbox are measurements. We are now doing a lot more measurements than ever before. We have our organoid models, we have our computational models, but we also have the ground truth, we have patients. And uh, uh, we can now, in a tumor tissue sample, uh, we can actually do single cell analysis. So we can look at hundreds of thousands of single cells. We can see where the cell came from, what it's doing in terms of RNA uh, expression, what it's doing in terms of protein expression. So we can read and listen in to this crosstalk by uh, the cells in the tumor. And based on this, we hope to be able to, by mathematical modeling, map out uh, the cancer immunity state space to understand where I, as a patient, where I am in this space, uh, if I'm approaching a more healthy state or not. This is the hope we have. Uh, and of course, to, to finish off here, I mean, clinicians, they have always looked at patients, measured some things, and tried to cure, and this will not change. The, what, what is changing is that we have much more data, much more precision in, in, in doing our predictions of how a certain intervention will work. And we have then the ability to individualize the treatment really based on all this data. To do that, we really need this human-machine partnership. There's so much data that you as a human cannot interpret, not alone, so we need a tool, uh, we need digital assistance, and you cannot, you know, uh, it's impossible to not think about when, when Kaspar lost uh, in 97 against Deep Blue, and where we said that this was the first time that AI could do intuitive stuff better than, than a grandmaster. And now, uh, I mean, you have, of course, all of you have already written this talk by using chat GPT, right? Just feeding in some, some of the keywords. Uh, and of course, things like this will help. But in order to uh, achieve the goal of really understanding and modeling uh, cancer, for instance, we need a joint effort by humans, and it has to be multidisciplinary. This will not be done alone by computational scientists or mathematicians or biologists and immunologists. We need to work together. And I think in the interface here, uh, we need to have this human-machine partnership really take the benefit from the, from the best of two worlds. And it would be pretty nice, so this is a call to action, right? It would be pretty nice if we down the road from here, together, jointly all of us could say that, well, you can pretty much say that we, we cure cancer. Thank you. I was, I was wondering, um, you mentioned something like, like there are uh, about one and then 13 zeros of cells in your body. Yes. And if I look at the fastest supercomputer at the moment, that is, he's, he's, it's capable of, of making one and 18 zeros of calculations. So can you say something about the scale of, uh, like Professor Wilkins mm -hmm. mentioned before, that there's a scale problem here, right? Yeah. How, how, how far are you? Well, I mean, uh, exactly as, as was pointed out, I mean, we, we, are, we are just beginning because it's not only 10, you know, three, three times 10 to the power of 13 cells, they all talk to each other. Yeah. So the connections here are, uh, you know, more connections than the atoms in the known universe, right? Uh, still, you cannot give up, right? We, we uh, look at the fusion. If you look at it from the perspective of all these molecules interacting and trying to do direct computation, you're lost, right? Yeah. Still, the diffusion equation, the heat equation, is a fair uh, approximation that works for many uh, uh, situations. I'm not uh, suggesting that we will find similarly easy models here, but I do think that we, by combining several of them in several layers, 
we will do much better than we do today. And, and, and the hope I see is that we do get computational scientists seriously engaging uh, with biologists and working to solve those questions together. So I, I'm pretty confident that we will see amazing uh, progress over the next 10 years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we talked about the, the advancements of, of mathematics in, in biology and in medicine, and there's also uh, a, another big field that, that requires a lot of mathematical attention, and that has to do with climate change. And how uh, mathematics can aid in the understanding of this very uh, big, uh, dangerous uh, phenomenon. And now we have two talks concentrating on, uh, on this. Um, I mentioned something about the, the fastest supercomputer, and I think that is actually at Oak Ridge National Laboratory at the USA at the moment. Um, and so uh, uh, we are blessed to have Kate Evans now, uh, who works there. And um, she has very impressive computing uh, facilities, uh, facilities and, and, and um, uh, performing very challenging work. And she will talk about the applied mathematics being able to uh, prepare the world um, for the challenges of, of uh, global warming. Um, she uses mathematics to recreate and analyze uh, ocean and atmospheric behavior um, using these enormous supercomputers. So please um, give a big round of applause for uh, Kate Evans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about my passion, which is using math to tackle our unsolved problems of climate change. I don't want to put her. Okay. So at its very basic level, climate change is a chemistry problem. The sun's rays hit molecules in the atmosphere and they trap heat, and those rays can come from the sun or from the Earth's surface. That's the greenhouse effect. And thank goodness we have it. Without it, the Earth's surface on average would be about negative 20 degrees Celsius. But the details matter. So if we, let me pause that a second. If we have more molecules that release heat or trap heat, the atmosphere warms because there's more of those molecules and that's global warming. But as I mentioned, the details are the ball game. And that's where physics comes in. Oh, sorry guys. The physics is a shite, but that's okay. So, imagine a world of physics. <laughs> so you have the sun's rays that come in, and they come in unevenly. That's why we have the poles and equator, right? And the Earth has a rotational tilt to its axis. So as it travels around the sun, we have seasons. So local climate is variable, right? And the big one, there it goes, excellent. So the ocean, the land, and the ice all absorb and release heat differently. That's why we each have our own local climate. It's why some of us have a lot of rain and some of us don't. And different types of weather patterns and all those things. And physics helps us understand that. Now let's not forget biology. We just heard about that. Biology is critically important too. It helps regulate and it helps support our greenhouse. The plants, the soils, and the animals all contribute to releasing and absorbing air that impacts our climate as well. But the great connecting part of this is math. Here, applied math. It is the great explainer, the language that we use to express the science that we're doing. Now, excellent. Okay. So, I'm not here to talk about global warming other than what I just told you. There are many great talks and resources for that, and I'll show some at the end, so if you want to know more. But um, it's important to think about not the problem, but the solution. And math is helping us with that solution. For example, um, well, I should start with this. Whether plant scientists use similar math, they live in the same Earth system, they're studying the same Earth system. So weather and climate are very linked. But whereas weather scientists look at storms and storm systems, like this beautiful thunderstorm that sat over my backyard last July, they 
look at that, and then you've got climate scientists who look at patterns and trends. So they take the weather, and they look at the statistics of weather. So that's the whole statistics of climate and weather. For example, this storm system, you get different kinds of storms at different kinds of climates. El Nino and La Nina, which we all know is that heat uh, over the equatorial Pacific. It changes year by year. It turns out that that actually impacts storms over places like California and the West Coast US and um, Central America and sometimes even um, closer towards my neighborhoods. We would never have known that had we not had the math and the statistics to understand those remote connections between weather and climate. <coughs> Let me tell you a story. History is always a fun part of science. So before we knew very much anything about weather and climate, a renaissance of sorts was unfolding in the second half of the 19th century. And a lot of this was happening over Europe. But I'm going to tell you a US piece of the story because it was our storms that generated a lot of the interest. So there was a guy in 1821. His name was William Redfield. He was a New York businessman, but also sort of an amateur engineer. He noticed, he was in Connecticut, that the storm damage was in the southeast direction from a hurricane that had just come off the coast of the U.S. And he had been in Massachusetts the day before. And the storm damage was going in the northwest direction. That's the orange state you see there. So he was intrigued by that. He said, well, I'm going to gather data from all over all the newspaper reports, everything he could get about that hurricane, got all the data, and from that decided, I think these storms are great moving whirlwinds. Hmm. So life went on, and he lived his life, and we all lived our lives. He was on a ship 10 years later, and he saw a math and physics professor from Yale named Denison Olmsted. He tells him about his theory, and Olmsted says, you should publish this. You early career scientists in the audience, you should publish it. It might be actually a good idea. So he publishes his theory. Meanwhile, there's a guy named George Jesse. He's a mathematician from Pennsylvania. He sees this, and, and I should mention, he's interested in cloud physics. So we didn't understand about clouds. Back then, weather scientists didn't understand that water, which is denser than air, could actually rise into the atmosphere as floating clouds. How could it be? So they were working on this problem, and SV had this idea that actually water vapor would rise in the air and be carried aloft and condense its clouds through these rising uh, air masses called thermals. And any of you who've been on an airplane know what thermals are, right? You go through a bumpy, uh, a cloudy sky, thermals. So he had this theory, but he saw Redfield's paper and he said, that doesn't jive with my theory about cloud physics, so he picked a fight with it. Now, in science and math, picking a fight means you write a strongly worded journal article saying my theory is right and yours is wrong. But uh, he did that, and Redfield saw his paper, Essie's paper, and wrote his own strongly worded article back. So he threw another punch, right? And they bantered back and forth. And this was great because they lit up huge interest in the weather and science community, and the field advanced. So some of SD's theory was correct, some of Redfield's was correct, and they all got together. And that, those crazy characters, plus all these other folks who got involved, put together these large equations that we now use to study the atmosphere and ocean. It can't be math off of that big set of equations, so you're welcome. Now, don't, don't worry about this. All this is, the Greek letters, the symbols, and all that, this is just all those relationships I was talking about, just all the different forces that balance, all those things. It's just that mass can't change. You can't create or destroy mass. You can't create or destroy energy. It's all those things in those complicated looking equations. That's how we sound important. So what do we do with them? We solve them. Sure. No problem. <laughs> Turns out you can't solve them exactly. You have to figure it out the hard way, which is what mathematicians call guessing. They estimate the solution in the future. They, they plug in the numbers and see how close they are and go, eh, 
Okay, we need to update that solution. And you iterate. You guess even better and better. You estimate. It's just optimal guessing until we get to the solution. Now, the problem is, <laughs> it's not just one point in the atmosphere that we need that answer. We need to know what's going on in the atmosphere, in the ocean, and land and ice sheets. We need to know it everywhere, all around the globe, from the ground all the way up to space. We need to know it for all time. So, all is not lost. We take Earth and we make it a grid. What do we do and how do we, how do, we do that? Well, there's many ways to make a grid, right? But now we're solving a finite number of problems rather than an infinite one. So we're already infinitely better than we were before. So how many points do we need? Well, if you imagine we want to see a hurricane or model that, we need a lot of points in a very small area near the hurricane, right? So you can see what's going on and, and resolve it. But if you want to know what the global temperatures will be in 50 years, you don't need as many points. You need to get the general gist of what's happening, which you need for a long period of time. So we can play with our grids and, and, and use it to solve the kind of problem we want to solve. Same thing when you go vertical from the surface out. We can add levels or subtract them based on what we want to see. In fact, this grid here is one that we use a lot. We like this because it's called a cube sphere. Classic math thing. You take a really complicated problem, you make it a cube, you solve it, you're done, right? <laughs> but it turns out we have steps, right? You take a simple problem and then you solve the more complicated one from there. If you imagine this as a square balloon, you blow into it and you interpolate out and you get, you get the earth. So we have tricks and tools to get from a simple problem to a complicated one. So, great. Take out your calculator, let's start solving climate problems. Well, let's see. Okay, so if we want to look at our modern problems today, we want to understand both hurricanes and global temperatures. We want to solve them together. So we take about 500 points along a cube face times another 500 points along a cube face. There are six cube faces. We want to solve about 100 levels in the atmosphere. We want to know this for about 50 different types of variables. So we want to understand the solution in terms of wind, temperature, uh, cloud physics meaning. So you want to know all the rain you can have, snow, gravel, sleep, all the stuff we had yesterday. And you want to solve for that. So that's about 7.5 billion points. So we need to solve these equations. Sounds like a lot. Well, SC and Redfield didn't have this. This is Frontier. And by the way, thank you for that introduction. Oak Ridge has the largest computer in the world according, according to the top 500 list. Not forever, but for now. And um, this gets all 10 to 18 plus per second. Well, I just told you we only needed 10 to the 9 points to solve the problem, so we're good, right? Well, it's a little more complicated than that because we need to go for many time steps, so we have to go forward in time and make our guesses and our estimates. And if you're looking at 50 years and you move forward about 30 minutes at a time, you're looking at another 10 to the 5th problems. And remember, I told you, you don't get the answer right away. You have to estimate and update your estimates. So each time you have to do that. So when you add all those numbers up, you're about 10 to 15 that you need to solve a full climate simulation. So you really do need one of these computers to solve climate. And of course, you do many of those simulations because you have a lot of problems to solve. So we're very happy to have this computer taken out for a test drive. It's brand spanking new. We haven't really taken out the plastic yet. What do we get when we're done with all that? OK, I hope this works. Let's try. Yes. So I'm not showing you an ocean simulation. The ocean off blue looks so pretty. So we ran a global ocean simulation recently using our product model. And you can see here, you get to see all the eddies. We have lots of points to resolve your problem. All the details in the circulation is just on a continuous loop. And I zoomed in here on the North Atlantic because Obviously, you guys care about the North Atlantic. Why? The Gulf Stream, right? So what you have here is hot, salty water in the tropics, and that water moves upwards the Gulf Stream. So those white lines you see are called streamlines, and it shows you the flow on the surface over time. That's the time average flow. And what it does is it takes all that heat, runs up the East Coast, and heads out over towards Europe, where you get much nicer, warmer weather than you would have otherwise. So yay, Gulf Stream. And this black lines here are also streamlined. What happens is that water releases its heat, gets dense, sinks, and then comes back down to the tropics. 
So it's what we call the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. Critically important for a lot of the climate and weather that we see in this part of the world. Climate scientists are very interested in this because as the ice sheets melt, they're going to release cold water. And that changes the density of the water that's already there, and it might mess with the circulation. Now, again, I'm not here to talk about the problem, but once we have this tool, using math, we can use it to solve the problem. Once we know what's happening, we can prevent it, we can mitigate it. Once we can see what's happening, then we can start moving forward. And that's the key to math, is finding solutions. I just want to mention, I've said a lot of different kinds of math in this talk. I talked about statistics, optimization, machine learning, uh, algorithms, all these different things were touched on. That's all different kinds of math all used to solve these problems. And I'm just going to put this up here in case you want to screenshot it, but these are some resources if you want to learn more about it. Thank you so much. So you mentioned um, sort of sort of the scale. Um, so uh, how much um, more would you need if you have like 10 to the 18th uh, flops? Uh, it's, it's difficult to, to, to wrap your head around how much you would need to um, say something about the circulation, for instance. Sure. So the problem I laid out for you, the 10 to the 15, is looking at the scale of large scale weather and climate. What we really want to know in the future is very localized things. So severe weather could impact, who's talking about? The electrical grid, among those other things. Things like that. We want to understand what's happening on a very local scale while still running very global simulations. So all those points I mentioned, you need to double the amount of points, quadruple the amount of points I just showed on the grid, which doubles and triples your computing power. And actually, it's even more than that because you need more estimates to get to your solution. So it multiplies and multiplies the more finer resolution of things that you want. And, and what, what kind of questions would you ultimately want to answer? How, how small is it right. on the scale? I want to know if it's going to rain in 50 years on Tuesday, the third. When we have more detail, we can make more connections between remote locations, very small things, all the way down to the molecular level, right? There's tons of molecules in the atmosphere. We're not resolving those. We're not resolving individual clouds. There's lots of things that we want to see that we can't see yet. So more computational time. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. hungry for it. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> speaker is originally from the UK, but he works at the University of Adelaide, as Australia is close to Antarctica. It's not surprising that he's particularly interested in the influence of huge uh, cold continents uh, on uh, climate change. In fact, the Southern Ocean is also known um, as one of Earth's uh, lungs, as it is both a massive carbon sink and an oxygen factory. It also soaks up much of the excess heat produced by human activities. Breakthroughs in understanding the southern ocean dynamics uh, are needed to generate higher confidence in models and hence better in, in climate communities against climate change. So, um, please give a big round of applause for uh, Luke Bennett and he will tell us all about this. Thank you so much. Luke. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, um, yes, I'm going to talk about a particular ocean. Uh, and some indications of the role that mathematics plays in understanding that ocean. But in general, oceans are our friends. They suck in carbon, they give out oxygen, they help our planet to breathe. They also soak up about 90% of the excess heat that we create by burning fossil fuels. Okay, so, imagine that I asked you, how many oceans are there on Earth? And imagine you were being clever, and a little bit funny, and you said, there's just one. 
because all of the identified functions are interconnected. But I would say to you that that is a bad answer. It is a static, flat world view which overlooks fundamental differences between the major water bodies. Instead, we need to take a dynamic, three-dimensional view of the oceans in order to appreciate their differences. And it is important to recognise those differences for public awareness of the way our planet works, of climate change, of science, and of mathematics that underpins it all. I want to talk about the Sun Ocean. It's an uninterrupted oceanic ring that sits beneath all of the continents inhabited by humans. It connects almost all of the major oceans to the north, and it's the gateway to the Antarctic to the south. I live in Adelaide. And the great Southern Ocean is on my doorstep. But it has influence over the entire planet. It's fine to refer to it as the Antarctic Ocean, so long as you don't confuse it with the Arctic Ocean. Because the Southern Ocean is very different from the Arctic Ocean. In fact, the Southern Ocean is like no other ocean. It's working harder than any other ocean to counteract climate change. So when I say that the sun ocean is hard working, what I'm talking about is the continual movement of water masses around it. And that's in both the horizontal and vertical directions. And that movement brings up cold water from deep down to the ocean surface, moves it north where it's heated, and is then moved back down deep again. And that process is driven in part by the strongest winds on Earth, which exist over the Sun Ocean. Those winds blow across the ocean surface without any land there to slow them down. And they generate the largest waves on the planet, which are up to 20 meters in height. That's a five-story building. Now, the, this harsh, dynamic, windy, wavy, Ocean is why sailors refer to the roaring 40s, furious 50s, and shrieking 60s. <coughs> Another reason that the Sun Ocean is special is because it's where the cold waters from the south meet warm waters from the north. And they meet in the strongest, fastest currents on our planet which is known as the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, or ACC. The ACC wraps all the way around the Southern Ocean, and it stretches many kilometers from the ocean surface to the seafloor. And it's pumping water around the Southern Ocean rapidly. And in doing so, it's redistributing heat, fresh water and carbon dioxide to all the other major oceans to the north. The ACC also plays an important role in protecting the icy Antarctic to the south from warm waters. So that includes the Antarctic Arching, which is by far the greatest store of fresh water on our planet, and by far the greatest threat is global sea level rise. The Southern Ocean 
comes into contact with the Antarctic ice through ice shells. They are the giant floating extensions of the ice sheet. And then there's the frozen surface of the ocean surrounding Antarctica, which is known as sea ice. Now, Antarctic sea ice plays an important role by reflecting the sun's rays to keep the sun and ocean cool. It's a really important component of the sun and ocean system. It expands and contracts with the seasons. In winter, it doubles the size of the polar ice cap. <coughs> now the bad news. Sun ocean is changing. It's warming, and that is having knock-on effects, such as record Antarctic sea ice lows and losses of major ice shells. It's not clear how much longer the sun ocean go on playing this critical role in the climate system. And the raw physics is straightforward. We keep on pumping carbon into the atmosphere, the oceans keep on warming, sea ice goes, ice shells collapse, and then some, uh, uh, the Antarctic ice melts into the sun ocean. But the details of how and when this might all play out. And also, the possibility that it will be reversible is fiendishly difficult. It requires that we understand the feedbacks between the different components of the sub ocean. So we have three main tools in order to understand the sub ocean and to make predictions. We have theory, we have observations, and we have numerical models. Mathematics underpins each of these three tools. So theory involves turning physics into mathematical equations. Mathematical algorithms are needed to turn observations into data. And numerical models are based on mathematical methods and approximations. Advances, real advances, come from using theory, observations, and numerical models together. I'm going to spend the rest of my talk giving you three examples from uh, Sun Ocean Science. My first example is the phenomenon of ocean waves breaking up continuous sea ice colors into small chunks of sea ice known as ice lows. Those ice lows melt far more rapidly than continuous ice colors. Now, what I'm showing you here is what I think is a fantastic recent observation of the phenomenon. It was taken by a drone. From this, we can extract proteins like ice flow sizes. We can analyze their statistical properties. Now, in the interests of complete transparency, that observation comes from an estuary in Quebec. And straight a bit further out with sharp eyes, yes, the waves in this case were generated by a ship passing by the ice. But I think it's a really exciting example of the sort of observations that you might get in the Southern Ocean in the future as drones and other technologies mature. And we're developing associated theories. They require us to couple together two existing, very different theories, like the water waves, the other sea ice. Started integrating those couple theories into numerical models to make predictions that could be verified by the observations. I'm 
the motivate a uh, second example using a short movie uh, which was generated using outputs from a high resolution ocean model, a numerical model. We'll start at the ocean surface with properties like the sea surface temperature and sea ice coverage. Now the real power of the model is that it allows us to pull back, strip away the surface layer of the ocean and look deep into the summer ocean to see what's going on. And there we find waterfalls of cold, dense water plummeting kilometers over the edge of the uh, Antarctic continental shelf. And also, underwater waves hundreds of metres high. Amazingly, we're also making observations deep under the ocean surface. We use thermometers attached to bombing robots, known as Argo floats. They dive kilometres beneath the ocean surface to make observations. They then return to the surface to array data to satellites. Developing mathematical theories for such a complex system as a three-dimensional ocean is quite frankly intimidating. Now, one trick that is commonly used is to treat the ocean as a stack of water layers where each layer has uniform properties. And that sort of theory can make predictions for example, how the Antarctic Circle Pole Current interacts with mountains and cliffs on the seafloor to send cold bottom water up to the ocean surface in a process called upwelling. Now we're going to travel to the Thwaites Glacier, nicknamed the Doomsday Glacier, as it's considered to be the greatest threat to sea level rise over the next decade. That's because the base of the ice shelf that it's attached to is thinning rapidly. A so-called ground line is retreating. In order to make observations of this, a team of scientists recently drilled through over 500 metres of ice above the ground line. And they deployed an underwater robot through that in the water cavity beneath the shelf in order to observe the ice shelf base, where they found features which they called terraces, which give some clues about melting processes going on there. Melts of the ice base can't be predicted simply from knowing the ocean temperature. We need to know about how both heat and salt are moved between the ice and water models on the scale of an ice shelf. So we need theories such as for so called diffusive staircase structures of water layers beneath my shells, which control melt rates. We can then feed these theories into numerical models and make predictions. However, this theory and those in previous examples I've given are not standards in predictions given by, for example, climate models. There are lots of tests validations and calibrations that are needed. Okay, well, I hope in this relatively short talk that I've given you some ideas about why the sun and ocean is crucial to our planet. Uh, and I also hope that uh, I've given some explanations of why mathematics is so important to understand the sun ocean and to predict its future. Thank you. Thank you so much, I, I was wondering, though, is
is there um, something that you can say about how important the ACC is in a more uh, quantitative way? In the sense that <coughs> the ACC is, is speeding up, uh, but do we know, uh, as, as far as I understand, but, but do we know what the, the impact will be in, in the sense that it had a, a, a tipping point, or do you know that it will do something to the climate sensitivity of the Earth? Will it increase it or decrease it? Do we have any idea how important it is in that sense? I can't quantify it. Yes. Setting aside, we, we may well know, and there are indications that an ACC is changing. It would be bad news. I mean, it would be just going by uh, the last example I gave up there. It would be very bad news for the Antarctic ice uh, if the uh, ACC breaks up because of the warming ocean, things get disrupted, everything is interlinked. Uh, that's a key message of my talk. And it could well happen. I'm not saying it's going to, you know, this is not. I'm not giving bad news when uh, I don't necessarily need to, but the fact is that it could. It, 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 and if it does, if it starts to break down, then warm waters more easily get south. They start affecting the Antarctic Ice Sheet. That's a scenario we really don't want to be in. Yes, uh, many of the 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 the, 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 the currents are, are changing mm. uh, will have profound effects. I was just wondering if there is some idea where it will, uh, what it will be the impact, or how important it is uh, in the whole system. Uh, That's uh, something we need to find out. It's immensely important. Yes. <laughs> um, I think the question is, um, what is going to suffer? the most uh, if the ACC is disrupted. Well, of course, then it comes down to what the disruption is exactly. So, I guess the answer that I was just giving you was on the basis that uh, the ACC could break up somehow, right? That uh, it would start to allow warm waters to uh, improve farther south. It might not be the case. I mean, it's also playing a great role in uh, mixing water around between the different oceans further north. So, um, there are many different things to be worried about in terms of the ACC. Um, I guess we'll have more in uh, 10 years' time. To, to, to make a, a long story short, it's vitally important that we know more. More yeah. research is needed, as usual, Absolutely. especially here. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, our um, next uh, speaker is um, uh, Kifumi, and she is uh, so called, uh, she calls herself the, the, the mathematical, mathematical, um, so it's gals in, in mathematical, um, and together with her colleague Jessica Williams, uh, they met in 2015 at the start of their PhD's applied mathematics at the University of Oxford, and uh, they bonded over their, their joint passion uh, for making mathematics accessible. And that is, desperately needed, and uh, promoting uh, its, its many applications and, and encouraging, especially girls, uh, to pursue careers in STEM subjects, uh, and women on STEM subjects. Uh, and on their web page, uh, he writes, motivates by the lack of general knowledge of the endless applications of mathematics. That was really resonated because that is something that I alluded to in the introduction uh, as well. And um, uh, she hopes that, that um, she can help banish the misconception that maths is useless by demonstrating uh, that it is the language of our universe and truly everywhere. So, here, here, I would say uh, she now works at NASA and uh, she will uh, explain to us what smoothies have to do with stars. So, that sounds awesome. So, please give a big round of applause for uh, uh, Keith Rooney. Thank you very much, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to talk to you about mathematically modeling the world around us from smoothies to the stars. So just before I begin, I got a brilliant introduction there, but a little bit about me. I am from Belfast in Ireland. I studied my undergraduate in pure maths 
at Trinity College Dublin before undertaking my PhD in Applied Mathematics at the University of Oxford. Uh, for the last three years, I've been working as a research scientist at NASA Ames. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Mathematica Alice, which um, has been explained to be an outreach initiative aimed to encourage more girls to consider careers in mathematics, but also just to make maths more accessible, more fun, and showcase all of the different ways it impacts our lives. And in this conference, in this session, is the perfect example of many of those ways. I don't know what is. So we've heard a lot of mathematical models so far. We've already got a really fascinating insight into different areas where maths is critically important. But just strip it all the way back, what is mathematical modeling in itself? Well, models in general, models that you'll come across, um, be it model trains, model airplanes, or even those little tiny versions of your city that you might see in a museum or a tourist center, Models help us understand complex, complex systems. Things that are big or difficult or far away or anything that just is a bit beyond our reach, we can use models to simplify that and get information and knowledge and, and build up our understanding. So this middle image that you can see, this is a model of the space shuttle within the wind tunnels at NASA, where the engineers were testing out how the space shuttle would cook in extreme environments that it would be subject to when it tried to get into, into space. So a lot of them are models are so they're so important to test things out before we start going to the real thing. It's cheaper. Uh, you can you can change things easier, you can really test what's gonna happen before you throw your millions of dollars of funding into the into the big mission. And the mathematical models as we've heard simplify that even further. Because we can begin to understand complex systems on a computer or even on a piece of paper. So even cheaper, even quicker, and you've got far more control of your environment, your parameters, you can make so many more tweaks. And mathematical models can be self-sufficient, they can be enough, that be all we need to make decisions, or it can be the first step before we start to develop physical models, before we start to develop the final product. Oh, why do we care? Well, there's so many areas of mathematical modeling that are important, and we've heard about all of them so far. And I came to write this talk, I found it really difficult. Not because I didn't know what to say, but because there was just too much to cover in 15 minutes. So I'm going to just touch on three important areas of mathematical modeling, the first of which is for prediction. So we've already heard a lot about climate and about weather. So every time you open the weather app on your phone, you're looking at the output of a mathematical model to help us understand is it going to be sunny on Saturday or can I plan that picnic? We're also very familiar with the use of mathematical models to understand the spread of disease. Uh, during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were constantly being bombarded with this is the next peak and this is how many deaths we expect. But not only was mathematical modeling important to understand the number of cases and to predict um, how many people might become infected, but it was also used to try and understand how does the disease, the airborne particles, actually propagate from person to person, and how might an infected person end up passing on the disease. So the large scientists to inform us how far apart we should stand in order to try and mitigate transmission. Number two is discovery. So we've talked about having the space shuttle test in wind tunnels. And if you've got access to that, that's brilliant. If you can take something, generate data, have samples, that can be extremely important. But what happens if your system is too hot, too far away, too difficult to take samples? In that case, we rely very heavily on models. And that is the case for trying to understand what planets are made of, exoplanets. They're so far away, we can't go there, we can't sample the atmosphere, we can't look at the soil. So we rely heavily on the data we're getting back from telescopes and from mathematical models to help us understand that data and predict what we think the planet might be made of. So now we've got discovery. Uh, we can't 
really see firsthand necessarily how drug is interacting with cells and in the body, have we also heard. So models can be extremely important to try and see how a drug might try and treat a disease before we start testing this on humans. And finally, optimization, which might be one of the most important areas for industrial mathematics. How to make things better, faster, stronger. All of these things can be helped with the use of mathematical models. So every time you get a new iPhone, your battery lasts a bit longer. There is a massive area of mathematics dedicated to battery modeling. As we try to move towards a carbon zero future, as we try to eliminate the use of fossil fuels, we're becoming more and more dependent on batteries. So there's a, a huge push to try and improve our batteries and mathematical modeling is at the core of that. Just making cars more faster, Formula One, aerodynamics, that's all coming down to mathematics. Mathematics is at the core of all of these things. And I just want to pause on optimization for a moment because I mentioned I did my PhD at Oxford. The course itself was called Industry Focused Mathematical Modeling. And what happened was companies and industries would come to us with a problem that they had in their, in their industry that they wanted mathematics to solve, to help them get to the bottom of their problem. So the first ever research project I worked on um, as a PhD student was from a company called Chart Ninja. You might know their Hoovers or their hair wrap, air wrap dupes, or maybe their blenders. And it was the blender part of the company that I was working with. And I asked, how do we make our smoothies smooth, but keep our blenders quiet? So what they were finding was they were getting these brilliant smoothies, they were so smooth, they were, the smoothie, the blender was doing its job, but it was very, very noisy. And that was the biggest customer complaint was that they got a great smoothie, but they almost didn't want to turn it on because it was so noisy. So Sharp Ninja came to Oxford and they said, how can we solve this problem? Can, you, can my bats help me get to the bottom of this? <coughs> so where do you start? How can you begin to figure out how to get a smoothie smooth and keep it quiet? So the trick is to start with the simplest possible model. In all of the cases that we talked about today, the starting point is as simple as you can make it. So that's what we did. So I want you to imagine putting a carrot into a blender. That's it. What happens? You turn the blender on, the blade starts to spin, the carrot might get chopped. And as it spins and it keeps going, it gets chopped some more, until eventually you'll end up with lots of smaller pieces of carrot of lots of different sizes. But depending on how you chop, how long you chop for, and the type of blade you use, you'll end up with different sizes and different numbers of sizes, different numbers of pieces of carrot. So you could have only a couple of big pieces and lots of small pieces, which is sort of what you want. Or you could have a big chunky smoothie with loads of big pieces and only a few small pieces. So that's the essence of the problem. That's the core of the simple model. But how do you actually turn this into a mathematical model? Well, our approach was to just keep track of the number of pieces of each size. Okay, so I mentioned there's lots of different sizes, so all we're going to try and do is count the number of pieces of every size. So what I mean by that is, let's imagine we're trying to keep track of pieces of this size. So we're starting with six. What happens when we turn the blender on? The blades go around. Some of these pieces are going to get chopped to become smaller pieces. So they're no longer the pieces we're interested in. They're, they're gone. So now we have four left. But what will also happen is there'll be bigger pieces in the blender that as the blades spin, they also get chopped and they might form pieces of the size we care about. So we gain some pieces from, from this. So if we're doing this somewhat mathematically, we can think about this as the number of pieces of the size we care about after a chop is equal to the number of pieces before the chop. Take away or subtract any pieces that got chopped and became smaller, but add on any pieces that were created by having larger particles that got chopped down. Okay? So 
this, this is it, right? This is the model. That's as simple as it is. And we formulated something without even really using any numbers. The only mathematical thing that we've got in there is plus and minus sign. But if you understand it, you understand the model. And you can obviously start to add things in, but this is really the core. So, of course, we did formulate this a bit more mathematically and introduce some more mathematical symbols. Um, but this is the this is the the essence. Does it work? So this is a graph given to us by the company. I so said I had some fancy lasers and things that were able to measure the diameter or the size of the carrot pieces and how much carrot corresponded to that size. So you see, oops, okay, sweaty, that's my model. So the size piece is along the x axis and then the volume of, of pieces is like the amount of carrot corresponding to that piece. And then this second graph is the output of our model. So you can already see we're capturing shape really well. We're even getting our peak at about the right size and about the right height. And I just really want to emphasize how simple this model was. It was only thinking about shopping. We weren't thinking about fluid dynamics. We didn't have any juice in there. We weren't thinking about mixing or the shape of the vessel. All of those things were omitted from our initial assumptions. So what I'm trying to say is that you can make a lot of progress. You can get pretty insightful results from the simplest of cases. And then once you've got that foundation, once you've got that starting point, you can start to add more things in, make it more complex, and start to think about more complicated um, situations. Which brings me to exoplanets and trying to understand what they're made of. So some of you might be familiar with how scientists understand what a planet is made of. It's through a process called spectroscopy. And essentially that's just looking at the, the data that we get back from the telescope is called the electromagnetic spectrum. And the spectrum is all of the wavelengths of light, so kind of just like a rainbow where you have visible light broken up into all its colors. You can do that for the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So from gamma rays, radio waves, you can break that up into all the different wavelengths and look at the intensity of every wavelength, so the brightness, how much of each wavelength is being um, detected by the telescope from that planet. You get this squiggly line, and the squiggly line is the spectrum. And from the different peaks and the different features of this squiggly line, we can infer what chemicals might be in that planet, whether there's water, fingers crossed, or carbon dioxide, or nitrogen. You can get a lot of information from this spectrum. And we need mathematical models to help not only predict spectrums from what we know and see if we get what we expect but also to understand the spectrums that we're getting from the planets. Uh, it was mentioned, I think, by Karen that a lot of the data that we get from complex systems can be sparse or noisy. So you really do need those models to kind of get any um, you know, interesting or, or relevant information. So I, I don't think I have too much time left, but I'm just going to go through a really um, brief overview of one of the models that I worked on. And during my first year at NASA, which was to understand clouds in atmospheres. So just like when you look outside and you see white fluffy clouds in the sky, those are going to impact how planet Earth looks from far away. So if anybody was looking at our spectrum from light years away, those clouds would be really important to understand what the planet's made of. And there's clouds in exoplanets too, in fact there's even more problematic clouds than our own. So it's really important to understand these clouds to feed into our bigger atmospheric models. And this particular model is called Virga. It's an open source model, so everyone can go download it, play with it. There's some really nice tutorials to um, make it user friendly. And I've kind of broken it down into some main components. So we start with our assumptions and our inputs, which you do for every model. And just like with our blender, where we didn't worry about fluid dynamics, we didn't worry about mixing, we also, in this model, emit microphysics. So how cloud particles interact on a very small scale. We don't worry about that too much. The only microphysical process we care about in this particular model is condensation. 
and it's very heavily simplified. We also have pressure temperature profiles and imprints. So these are temperatures of the planet and different characteristics of the planet. And um, these parameters, this any fusion coefficient, how it mixes, sedimentation efficiency, how it rains, different things we put into the model. And the guts of the model is this middle section. And this is where the mathematical equations would be. But essentially what we're doing, what we're solving is at first we're balancing an upward turbulent mixing of cloud particles so as they rise and balancing that against downward sedimentation. So as the particles turn back into um, liquid and rain out. Once we've got that balance, we also have to come up with the particle size distribution. So really similar to what we just did with blenders, we want to know how much of the cloud is attributed to each particle size. Because the size of the cloud particles, the size of that condensate matter, is extremely important in understanding how the clouds will scatter out. And in the output of the model, we got our cloud profile, which we simplified into sort of three main parameters. And those parameters are what we would then put into a larger radiative transfer code to understand how the atmosphere, along with the clouds, would scatter out and produce a spectra. So I think I'll probably have time. So thank you very much for listening. If you're interested in learning more about mathematicals and um, the kind of work we're trying to do to encourage more young people to pursue careers in maths, please check out mathematicals.com or mathematicals on Instagram. Thank you. So you um, know about the weather on ET's planet, and you've chopped a carrot in a box. Now, why is it so difficult for non-mathematicians to be excited about maths? Because there are loads of, of, of cool topics. Why is it so difficult to convey? What's your um, experience in that regard? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's kind of at the core of mathematicals, or you're trying to try and figure out why there aren't enough girls in maths, and generally why people weren't interested in it. And we think there's a lot of stigma associated with mathematics. I'm sure lots of you have heard, if maybe you've expressed that you like maths, and the mathematicians in the room sure they have, and they've often been met with the response that, oh, I would to maths. Maths is never my thing. That's very difficult. What are you using that for? So I think right from when we're young, we're sort of being bombarded with this idea that maths is boring or nerdy or not useful. And that has a big impact on our perception of the subject. Um, I don't think in schools, or even often in universities, it's commonplace to discuss how applicable it is. And I don't think people realise that you could work for NASA with only mathematical training. Before I started, I had worked on NASA maths before. So, it's it's a it's more than a subject. It's like a way of thinking. It's problem solving, and um, can be applied to so many disciplines. And um, I think people don't quite realise that it's at the core of, of all the different things that they actually love. It is really interesting that at school you 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 can never be bullied because you're good at sports. <laughs> that, that is such an interesting difference mm -hmm. uh, in a sense. So do you have like? I, I assume many of the people here are mathematically um, uh, loving. Um, do you have like a tip for them to help inspire uh, people who are non-mathematicians? Because they're sometimes met with skepticism. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to make it accessible. So it's difficult as mathematicians when you actually love the equations and you love that detail. To read about. Mm -hmm. I, I find that a lot working with astrophysicists who sometimes don't care about how I solve an equation. You kind of have to take a step back and think, how can I make this interesting to my audience? What do they care about? I care about how to solve this integral, but they probably just care about how it's going to impact their everyday lives. So I think making it accessible, knowing your audience, um, is a really 
good way to try and get people on board and keep people engaged. Hands off to children, that really helps. Yeah. Getting grounded. I mean, exactly. I'm brutally honest, right? Oh, they are. They have the best questions. <laughs> they know more about this than I do, so I'm always in trouble when I'm giving talk to kids. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Speak round of applause, please. Thank you. Too. So, um, you've all heard in the, the news, uh, I would say, that there's a lot of problem with the electricity grid uh, in the Netherlands, but it's something that is um, a problem around the world. But um, we, we started with a very simple grid of, of a few producers, and we're all consumers, and, and all of a sudden we started producing ourselves, and now we're also sort of responsible for maintenance and, and everything. It's, it's becoming really difficult. And uh, so that is really a, a, a nice area where mathematics can uh, really save the day. And many mathematicians work on these kinds of challenges, um, uh, and especially uh, um, our next speaker from the Center of Mathematics and Computer Science in Amsterdam. He's an expert in these fields, and he develops uh, novel mathematical uh, methods to address this urgent problem. Please give a big round of applause for Bertrand. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm actually curious uh, who of you is actually Dutch. Wow, that's uh, impressive. So, did anybody see uh, this recent episode of Arjen Lubach about the Dutch uh, founder? I'm uh, curious. Uh, okay, some. Okay, and two people. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, for the international uh, uh, audience, Armin Lubach is, uh, is a TV host, and he gave a very good summary of the, the state of the Dutch uh, power grid. So, our power grid uh, is being used uh, way more heavily than it has been in the past. For example, we use our electricity to heat our homes, we use electricity to charge our vehicles, and that sort of demand for electricity has gone up a lot. And on the supply side of electricity, we also are changing things. We're phasing out fossil fuels. We have less coal plants. All the nuclear plants in France are, are altogether somehow under maintenance. Uh, this is causing problems. Uh, and, and, and so we are increasingly more reliable on, on sun and wind, and that, that is causing more uncertainty. And since so the power grid originally was not designed uh, with this type of uh, supply and demand pattern in mind. It was designed at a time that we did use fossil fuels. We, we have big power plants where we tra transform coal or gas into electricity, and to match supply and demand, we just let these power plants go a little slower or a little faster. Consumers did not have electric vehicles, so the, the, the demand for electricity was quite easy, comparatively easy to predict. And, 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 and these, these, these uh, developments together are causing these problems. Of course, mathematicians knew about this already a long time ago, but they didn't listen to us. And so I have colleagues from the University of Twente, and I'm curious, is anybody here from Lotton? Nobody, okay. So in Lotton, they did some tests, and they, they baked five pizzas and charged three electrical vehicles, and, and it went wrong. That, that happened in, in, in an experiment in around 2016. And uh, so, and that is the problem. Like when we say our, our, our grid is full, it means that if we add more connections to the network, we, we are risking the possibility of a blackout. And, 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 and why does this occur? Well, if we, if we add more connections, we overuse our network and then something might break. So, so for example, a line in the network might fail. As a result, all the electricity has to flow through other lines. Those lines get more overloaded. Some of those lines might also fail. And then in the end, we get a blackout. And, and that blackouts are, yeah, in, in a way, intriguing. It, it's, uh, somebody asked me, can you predict them? And, and my answer is, well, sometimes it takes two years to find out why blackouts even occur. So the question generally is no. It, it's really unpredictable. And so, for example, a uh, famous blackout was in the United States where uh, 55 million people got without power for up to four days. And it's also like, a, yeah, why did this occur? Well, in the end, they found out that uh, it was due to a software error somewhere. That, uh, and then the line hit the tree, it wasn't detected well, 
they start shutting down things preventively for the wrong reasons, and then the, 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 the electricity goes, oh, I'm making a mistake. I don't want to point out. I, the electricity was going, it was supposed to go like this, but it went suddenly across the other side of the Great Lakes, and then everything went back. And so, blackouts are a bad thing, and we want to prevent them uh, from happening. But unfortunately, uh, they sometimes do happen, and, and sometimes now it seems that renewables uh, are playing a role. For example, in southern Australia, in September 2016, they had a big storm, they had infrastructural damage, <clears throat> and then three months later there was a heat wave. And in Adelaide, were you working there? Were you living there at the time already? Yeah, so they were like, Adelaide is like a very sophisticated, nice city, but for several weeks, every half hour, they shut down electricity in the neighborhood to, to make sure that we were like controlled blackouts, which is something called brownouts. And it's really a bad thing. And then renewables were being blamed for that. And you can say, well, maybe it was the wrong reason or the right reason. They ended up uh, putting a very nice big battery, and that really improved things uh, a lot. But uh, unfortunately, they had again some issues uh, a few months ago. So, that's the point where is that, well, we need, we can also say, well, Southern Australia is not well connected to other parts of Australia and they need to improve connectivity. <laughs> then the question is, who's going to pay for this? It's like a game theoretic problem. They first shut down the coal plant, then they ask the neighbors, do you want to share the cost of adding a line? But of course, they didn't want to do that. Uh, so, that's a, it's a difficult problem. How do you time it well? It's an enormous logistical problem. Uh, we do need to add copper, but adding copper is slow and expensive, and you need to get permission for that. And so maybe instead, we should not only add copper, but we should also use the copper we have already in a more clever way, using better mathematics. Maybe that we should do that. So uh, this is uh, why mathematicians uh, were interested in this. And so mathematics has been quite successful, actually, in designing and also in transforming existing networks. And not only mathematics, but of course also technological inventions. For example, you see here a container. The container really has made logistic networks more efficient. Why? Well, you can put any type of product you want in this container, and you can ship the container on any type of network you want. See, uh, road or train, it doesn't really matter. And so this is really flexible. So, you have the, 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 the global logistics network now has this very nice hourglass architecture. If you, go, if you look like this, it's a bow tie, but I don't own any bow ties, so I thought hourglass is more appropriate. Uh, you have this hourglass architecture where all the physical details, all the different logistical networks are here. All the applications, the users, the companies who need to ship, transport things are here. And here at the center, are the algorithms is the mathematics together with this beautiful invention. Some people claim it's the invention of the century, but maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. Uh, so, it's, so that's kind of like the core of the hourglass architecture, and it's very nice. Another example where we have seen this is the internet. We used to have phone networks. If the, if the mayor wants to call the doctor, like 100 years ago, you would get like a, a person on the line saying, like, I'd like to talk to the mayor, please. And then this was like centralized control. It's extremely inefficient. Just imagine that we suppose we need to do that now. We call somebody, we get somebody on the line. That would be crazy. That, that's essentially what our current power grid still is. It's like the same as 100 years ago. In the internet now, we have much better architecture. We have the packet. The packet contains information. It's part of, of, of a phone conversation or it's part of a file. It doesn't matter. All you need is a part of the information and you have some information about senders and receivers. And then, so the packet here is in the middle, together with queuing network theory and other algorithms, especially TCP protocol, is a very nice clever algorithm that makes sure that you avoid excessive congestion. And then everything works fine. And it's really a miracle. Like, it's like 100 years ago, if I wanted to open a hotel, I had to build it first. Now I just open. I just go on a platform and I, 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 I fill out my name and I, 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 I essentially have my own private hotel. They don't, I mean, so it's really amazing it's possible. Of course, in Amsterdam, they don't like this because it generates too many tourists, but it's, this is like an amazing possibility of the internet. And so, 
the problem here is yes, but the question is what are we going to do here? And so, but there is a vision there that, uh, for example, I need electricity and my friend has solar panels and I need the electricity tomorrow. So why not have my friend send the electricity to me by email? Over and send to me by email, well, over a virtual line, over a virtual power line. If, if, if my friend can't sell it to me, maybe my friend wants to store the electricity in a virtual battery. Battery. So that's the idea, that we would like to have the power grid architecture in, in this R glass way. And for example, if there is a new physical a new physical idea, for example, hydrogen, hydrogen is here, but there is a new application on the user side right there that, that you somehow disconnect it to through a clever virtual layer in the network. But of course, so that, that gives rise to the idea of digital energy. But Digital energy sounds a little bit like an oxymoron. Can you really kind of pretend like this isn't there? Yeah. And it's really dangerous to do this, of course. And, and if you want to do that, you need a mathematical proof that it exists, that it's possible. So I got intrigued by that, by learning physics. It's like when I was in high school, I actually, I went, I must admit, I, I didn't study mathematics, I studied econometrics. But then during my PhD, that was fixed. Uh, uh, but, uh, I, I partly that do this, but it was always blowing fuses uh, during the, the physics classes, like the, 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 the practicum. Uh, I never used that, so I thought better not study physics. Uh, so the problem, the physics can be very, very unpredictable. So I have here a model. This is uh, the, the, the side grid model of Germany. It's, uh, you, can, you can find it on the web. And uh, we, we did some uh, tests on that. And uh, suppose there is this red line here close to Hamburg that is breaking, that is overloading. So this can overload, for example, because there is a lot of wind here. Yeah. So the question then would be, so that line is going to shut down. The question now is which lines will fail next? And I kind of, I didn't want to do a guess uh, answer because there are too many lines, but the answer is that the lines in yellow fail next. And so, so this, this propagation of failures, you can think of it as an epidemic, and people have tried to use traditional epidemic models that they really don't work. And the, the reason is very simple. Like if I sneeze, the three of you are, are a catch cold for me, because you're just you're, clo you're close to me. Uh, that's, that's how epidemic models work. I have you seen, you saw that in some of So in, in, in the physical, with, in progress, it doesn't work like that. You actually you get really long range uh, propagation of failures. And so you really can have like a line failing in Poland and then suddenly there could be a problem in Portugal. It's really anything is possible there. So it's really complicated. That makes physics really complicated. And so we have to also like analyzing blackouts mathematically was considered to be kind of like uh, difficult, but that was kind of like, I like the challenge. And so as a probabilist, what we typically do is like rather than just trying to understand how everything works mechanically, we try to find probabilistic uh, laws. And what, what was known is that in the United States, they, they, they diligently collected data on blackouts, at least since 1991. And what they found there is that there is a nice statistical law for the size of a blackout. And it turns out that the statistical law for the size of a blackout is approximately the same as we see on losses on the stock market. It follows a Pareto distribution. And this distribution has a property that most of the losses are caused by the big, the big ones. The small ones do not matter. And that's, a, that's for a mathematical modeler a first good thing. Because if you go through these data sets, you find out actually that there are like a thousand documented blackouts which are the result of uh, squirrels eating part of the grid or other animals. And, and as a mathematical modeler, we cannot put squirrels in our model. It's just, that's just ridiculous, right? So, we just have to ignore the squirrels. In any case, those blackouts are small anyway. We don't worry about them too much. And uh, so, but then the question is like, why do these big blackouts occur? Can we learn something from it? And the good news there is that actually we found that the physics, the underlying physics is not that important. What is the most important thing, if you want to, if you look at this from a microscopic point of view, is that, well, physics, Okay, physics, the, the propagation of failures is extremely complicated, but you always end up in a situation where the network breaks into several pieces. One piece has a shortage, the other piece may have surplus. And the piece with the shortage, that's where the big losses occur. And then the biggest city 
in that region is kind of determining the size of the blackout. And it turned out that the sizes of cities also have this stage statistical law, this Pareto distribution. And so that, that, that kind of has as a consequence uh, that uh, not, never upgrades really, not really going to solve the problem. At least like network upgrades are necessary to, 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 to make things work well on the average, but you're always going to have big blackouts. What we found from the data is that, so the sizes of blackouts, we cannot do much about it, but we found that the duration, like most of the blackouts are, are rather short-lived. So maybe we, we, instead we should, we should come up not investing all our money in animal copper, but also invest money in adding local solutions. That's kind of the insight that it is. Because like, what you want to do is be able to, to survive blackout of 12 hours, for example. Like if you do that, then, you, then the, the disruptive nature of blackouts is going to be reduced. And in, in that sense, maybe it's an optimistic statement that we actually might do better uh, if, we have more, if we have more solar rooftops or, or our electric vehicle has a full battery. We, we can use that and we can survive a blackout and we would have had problems in the past when we did not have this architecture. All right. So we did, we, we, we derived this insight actually using extreme value theory that has, is another mathematical theory that has been developed in the Netherlands by prophetic diecast. So there's also another feature of mathematics is that you, you develop a mathematical theory to solve a problem and then you forget about it for 50 years and then there's another problem that you can use to solve. That's, a, that's the beauty of mathematics, I would say. All right, I'm going to another problem which is a more, uh, not so much about blackout, but about the typical operation, and it's about electricity market. So here you see uh, German spot prices over a period of a couple of years, and they fluctuate wildly. And this is like, you know, we have seen this recently, that uh, prices especially because they've gone up. And uh, you can say, well, this is really a bad thing, and I, I agree, but at the end of the day, fluctuating prices are only a symptom. They are a symptom of congestion on the grid. And so what, what, what the electricity market try to do is they try to set the price to balance supply and demand in such a way that the cost for society is somehow minimized. But the price setting is kind of like we don't have a benevolent dictator, thank goodness. So it's kind of like a distributed, decentralized way of doing this to a market where people are, are trading. And yeah, the problem is that if you separate this price setting from the physics, then you're not really being efficient. Like, what you would like to do is you want to set the price in such a way that supply is equal to demand in such a way that our network, that, that the same the network, that there's not, that, that the, the voltages and the line flows are all in, in safe regions. But this is where the, the, the beauty of math comes in, and also like the challenge is that, especially these equations for voltages, if give regions of this size. This is, for example, for a classic model of, it's from an old paper of Ian Hiskins, uh, a classic model for two, uh, just two generators, and this is the, the feasible space of what you can uh, generate in terms of electricity uh, for, for voltage. It's really complicated. Just think about now the fact that I'm going to trade with my friend through email, and, and millions of people are going to do that, and you get really going to get in trouble. And, and so, so, like, integrating these physical models better into the market has been estimated that, uh, for example, in the United States, you can save billions a year. And, and it depends really on the country. For example, in the UK, it's kind of easier. As long as London is fine, they don't care. Uh, maybe I'm kind of over-exaggerating here. But, uh, like, what, uh, Iceland is just a nice circle with glacier in the middle. But, like, the United States is a complicated topology. So every country, but, like, it, it, yeah, it can really make a big difference. But fortunately, there is old mathematics. In this case, David Hilbert, in 1900, posed 23 problems. And the 17th problem of Hilbert is, says something about properties of polynomial equations. You don't have to know polynomials. All you need to know is that voltages actually have this structure. And the last 20 years, people have leveraged this insight and come up with new algorithms to solve these equations in a better way and to build better optimization algorithms. So the optimization, the last 20 years, people in optimization have made a lot of progress on this. And the first uh, new algorithms are already being deployed in practice. For example, I think in Switzerland now there's a more sophisticated uh, planning uh, in, in place. So that's kind of good news. 
uh, values is that it doesn't scale yet to this, this vision that everybody can trace. And this is kind of like a vision that the energy transition, as we, we heard, like we're going to be more responsible for our own electricity supply and, and, and for everything. And that, that, but it's also kind of like it's a promise that we can all, uh, we can all uh, also reap the benefits and we can all also all trade. And, and I'm kind of optimistic here because I think that from the internet, like, like if you see like what the internet is now compared to what the phone, how the phones were 100 years ago, still, if we now all try to call our friends simultaneously, uh, we again, we would, uh, we would get in trouble. Uh, the, the networks, uh, the wireless networks, the other networks are just not designed for that. We just have to fairly share all the resources. And so that's kind of like, like we, we're going to use mathematics to, to, to do this. Uh, but there are mathematical challenges there. For example, if you want to solve these planning problems uh, here, uh, and if you would like to solve them in such a way that privacy is preserved. So you need privacy preserving versions of these optimization algorithms. So that's really Challenging. But there are now nice mathematical models of what actually privacy means, differential privacy, and there are really lots of uh, interesting uh, problems uh, and ideas uh, uh, surfacing there. And so it's like, if you're a student and you want to work on this, uh, it's a great uh, field uh, to get your career in. And I'm kind of optimistic if I teach my classes like 20 years ago, everybody wanted to work on finance, make money, and now we're like this, this seems to be a more popular type of application. So, given that, I'm kind of optimistic that, 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 that I, I get to see a, uh, a situation where the power grid uh, works just as efficiently as the internet does today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> um, the, the, the internet has sort of, sort of grown organically. Um, but this, this seems like something that, that, that's difficult for people to grow organically because it, it needs some sort Yeah, you're remodeling, when we build the internet, it's like building a new home while not living in it yet. And now we live in the home and we have to build, that's much harder. Yes, so, so who should do this? I mean, do you have an idea of how this can actually be done? So, yeah, so that's an indeed a good question. So, like, I'm talking about where it's what kind of the vision on the horizon should be. And I think having this in place is really important. Uh, for example, Shannon from the internet in the 50s already said, if you want to submit the information over a channel and there's this much noise, this is how, how far you theoretically can go. Yeah. And uh, it took engineers 40 years to reach the theoretical limit. And so like, I think like, as mathematicians, we kind of need to say, if you want to have, if you want to have this percentage of renewables, and you want to have only uh, 30 minutes of uh, blackout, like 30 minutes a year of disturbances, then this is what you should be doing in, uh, in, an, in an idealized world on a cubic uh, Earth at the previous speaker. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of like a job, but that transition is it, an incredibly difficult job. Yeah. No. So for the scramble chickens in a vacuum. Um, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful presentation, and uh, let's, let's make this a reality. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, we are uh, nearing the final speaker of this evening, and he will uh, reflect on the importance of, of mathematics. He is a mathematician himself, an ambassador for the Dutch platform of mathematics, and professor in economics at the University of Amsterdam. And he, uh, he, he also known as the, the, the former chair of the Social Economic uh, Council, the SER, and he is. Uh, sort of an enormous long list of things. Um, I, I assume you all know him. Uh, it's always a delight uh, to listen to his wisdom. Please give a big round of applause for former Senator Alexander Lieberman. Thank you very much for a nice introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be the final speaker of a wonderful evening. Wonderful. This has been a fantastic event. I hope you have all enjoyed it as much as I did. Have these fantastic speakers here with us tonight. This showcase, if you will, of applied mathematics. Just this demonstration of what mathematics can do and thus accomplish in the real world. It's a fantastic story. It's really a pleasure to, to wind up. 
And uh, I'm well aware of the fact that I'm not the only person between you and the drink. So uh, don't worry, I will be, I will be brief. But you will forgive me for just expressing that pleasure of finding so many people interested in mathematics, practicing mathematics, possibly both, only one whole. It's a, a very special occasion. One colleague of mine one time ago told me that he gave a lecture on applied mathematics in a soccer stadium with 60,000 people listening to him. That's hard to beat, but we're getting close. And we're moving in the right direction. I was asked, uh, among other things, to summarize what this evening has learned us. That is not an easy question, but in a way it is, because the summary is, in a way, what is written in mathematics is a mirror, a true mirror. And I want to say a little bit more about what makes it so miraculous as we go forward. But before we get to those miracles, there is another miracle that I want to draw your attention to, which is the miracle that Siam is here in the Netherlands. And, and that is not self-explanatory. If you look at this map, you will see there were plenty of alternative countries to go to. <laughs> uh, and nevertheless, Siam is here. We should count our blessings and, and let me welcome all the Siam participants in the Netherlands once again. Uh, but so there are so many alternatives, and you might wonder why is Siam here in the first place. And there is, for those of you who know, an unfortunate resemblance to the way in which the World Championship soccer moved to Qatar. So <laughs> not a, a, a parallel and a metaphor to be particularly proud of. And I want to reassure all of you that there are very solid reasons for Siam to come to the Netherlands to organize a conference on applied mathematics. Because the Dutch have a distinguished track record in applied mathematics. And I just want to spend a little time on their track record. So what I'm going to do is give you a sample from this one of my favorite books in my library, the book of famous Dutch applied mathematicians. And if you are impressed by the volume of this particular book, let me assure you one thing, it is much, much thicker than the book of famous Qatar soccer players. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is just sample a few pages from this huge book, and so as to convince you all that science is here for the right reasons, and also to make the Dutch here feel a little bit proud of their country. So here are a few famous Dutch applied mathematicians. Just very quickly, the first one is here, René Descartes. He was an inventor of algebra, and he lived in Amsterdam around 1630, roughly. And in fact, he lived on the Kalverstraat, the street that I recommend to all the non-Dutch here for a shopping excursion. It's not far from here. You may think, you may think that Descartes was French. But let me say this, if the French claim that Vincent van Gogh was French, then I think we can claim that Descartes is Dutch. <laughs> so, let's claim him here and now. First example. Second example. Equally famous, I would say, Christian Huytens. The name that only the Dutch can pronounce correctly. <laughs> Christian Huytens, a colleague, a contemporary of Descartes, of Newton, multi-gifted person, the inventor of many things, but also of the pendulum clock, you see it here. And interestingly enough, it's used as a navigation device on ships. Uh, Harris had a very interesting career. He unsuccessfully tried his second career in Paris. It didn't work out. I suspect the French were taking revenge for their cut. <laughs> so then we have another famous name on this list. I hope the Dutch will recognize the list. Simon Stevin, also an inventor of many things, uh, including the decimal notation. It seems an easy thing, but you've got to think of it for the first time, and he did. And he also invented many much more enjoyable things. For instance, this contraption that you see here, which I probably should pronounce as the sail wagon. It also is not selling beer, but nevertheless, a very enjoyable ride on the beach. So, we can thank Simon Stevin for this particular contribution. 
He was another famous Dutch applied mathematician. I suspect maybe even the Dutch name of the girl. His name was Rudolf van Keulen. And he is actually a sort of computational mathematician in the early days. He's mostly famous for calculating the 35 decimals of the number 5. And uh, if you don't believe me, you can go to the church. You see on the right a pillar in the church in Leiden, the Peter's Care. And if you look very carefully, you see those numbers around that circle. The first 35, without a single mistake, an accomplishment as such. So Rudolf von Keulen, small but significant applied mathematician. Here's another example that I hope the Dutch will recognize. A prominent politician, Johan de Witt, who also was the father of actuarial mathematics, the mathematics of the insurance. Unfortunately, he was also the only actuarial mathematician who was the victim of a political assassination, as you can see on the right. Uh, all the more sad if you realize what a specialization was. Uh, but nevertheless, that is how he went. So, other than that, he had a splendid and extremely successful life. Then, this is a mathematician, another Dutch mathematician, that I suspect will be very well known to some of our speakers, because Kwartelech, in 1895, much later, proposed a mathematical model for the waves, oscillation of waves on shallow water surfaces. And uh, this, of course, every presentation here tonight has one mathematical equation. This is mine. So, uh, I won't even try to explain it. I just want to mention that Kortelev did his work together with De Vries, and nobody has been able to find out who De Vries was. Uh, this is also the most common Dutch name, so it's not that surprising. Nevertheless, the two of them did it and uh, made history in doing so. And again, I suspect, for instance, that Luke and Kate are well, well aware of the Kortelev De Vries equations. Just a few more. Here is another famous, much more recent Dutch applied mathematician, Arthur Weinkarde. Now we get into the category of people that some of us actually have met. So I have met Arthur Weinkarde, he died in 1987. He invented a legendary programming language called Elbow 1968, and he invented it, as you may have guessed, in 1968. And you see here uh, his face and his portrait, and you also see here. Uh, that Dutch are very good at sharing big committees, those that the folks from Bankai did extremely well. And finally, to wind up uh, just a small sample, we have another famous Dutch applied mathematician who died unfortunately in 2002, Esther Dijkstra, who, for instance, invented a very, very famous shortest path algorithm that many of you will recognize, but also was the father of structured programming. And he not only was a very good mathematician, but also one that liked to be quoted. And one of the quotes that here that I like best is when he said, mathematicians are like managers. They prefer improvement over change. This is something you want to think about perhaps. So this is the list of Dutch applied mathematicians. And I hope that it has convinced you that Siam is here for the right reason if you're not informed at least impressed. But um, and you'll forget me by not extend for not extending the list further. And you'll also forgive me for observing that what makes mathematics so special is first of all there's so many special mathematicians like the examples that I've shown, but the discipline itself is also very, very special. And I now want to talk about the miracles of mathematics. And actually, there are at least three. And this is really the first miracle of mathematics. And this is the first time that it becomes helpful to this huge screen. Because all of you can now look at this math, math, the math, the math of mathematics. Uh, all the mathematicians here can see if their own pet topic is somewhere on this map. And if it isn't, that just illustrates my point. Mathematics has just grown, has just grown beyond recognition. The people like Descartes and Huygens could easily overview whatever the mathematical universe was in their days, but of course nobody can even get close to doing that today. And 
his successors and there are many of them in this hall right now can simply not avoid some kind of super specialization, some very small domain on this very huge map. And that map that is growing day by day. Every mathematician recognizes the size of this domain. And of course, what is so nice about mathematics is that something that is true at some point remains true forever. And this is a handicap that physicians and others have to face up to. The mathematicians, when they have realized something is true, then basically they're going to stick with it for the rest of their lives and beyond. So it is a huge discipline, and it is still growing, and there are all sorts of developments that all of you are aware of in technology and beyond that will ensure its ongoing growth. This is a huge, huge discipline. First miracle. The second miracle is what uh, some speakers have referred to, um, and which I would like to refer to as the beauty of mathematics. It really is a beautiful discipline, but in a very special way. And nobody ever said it better than Bertrand Russell. So while you are reading this particular quote, you will realize, I hope, certainly if you are a mathematician, it's true, because mathematics is beautiful in terms of its results, for instance, in terms of that usual picture on the top right, and there are many like those, as I'm sure you know, but also in terms of its method, in terms of its proofs, in terms of its location, it has a very particular, profound beauty. And that beauty, as uh, Russell puts it so nicely, that has something sublimely pure, a stern perfection, a beauty that is cold and austere, I think that summarizes it very well. And sometimes perhaps it is sterile, but nonetheless, as a whole, very convincing and very integral part of this very special, special discipline. So, the beauty of mathematics is something that I think especially mathematicians are well aware of. It's very hard to convey. It's hard to explain to others, but I think we all recognize. And I hope that some of the non-mathematicians here sense vaguely, perhaps, its truth and its significance. So mathematics then is a very beautiful discipline. The third miracle of mathematics, I think, is what you might think of as the efficiency of mathematics. And there, the most famous quote, perhaps the most famous quote all over on this particular topic is the quote that I'm giving you here from Eugene Wigner, Nobel Prize winner, who said the unreasonable efficiency of mathematics is a gift we neither understand nor deserve. I think it sums it up very nicely. Because it has puzzled people over the ages why mathematics is so enormously useful. How is it possible that this very abstract structure embodies the real world in a very profound sense? How is it possible that the real world creeps into these theoretical abstract structures and then yields all these surprising dividends, these surprising applications? So one of the speakers said, at some point, all of a sudden, you realize that a certain piece of mathematics is enormously useful, and 50 years nothing happens, and all of a sudden, the same piece of mathematics is very useful, again, in a very different domain. It is a miracle. And of course, people have tried to explain it. Philosophers have lots to try to explain it. Mathematicians have generally ignored those philosophers. They just continue to do mathematics and enjoy the benefits of this very, very puzzling and deep connection. Yes, mathematics is unbelievably efficient. It delivers from day to day and tonight We've seen wonderful examples of the various domains where the efficiency, the applicability shows up in many surprising senses of the word. So here we have the three miracles of mathematics, if you will. But in fact, there is a fourth one. And the fourth one, I think, before I get to that, let me just quote and, and, and demonstrate the efficiency of mathematics on this slide that I have overlooked. But this slide is a very dark slide, because the Netherlands is such a small country that people here can actually compute how useful mathematics actually is. And they did. And so there is this consulting service who came up with the outcome. It supports about a quarter of all the Dutch jobs. 
that supports about 30% of gross value produced in the Dutch economy. Now, again, this is a huge screen. You can look through all those numbers if you wish, but I think you might be happy and ready to believe that this is more like what it says. Mathematics, again, is unbelievably efficient. It really delivers. It certainly delivers for this country. What is the fourth miracle of mathematics? The fourth miracle of mathematics, I think, and that is where I will complete my presentation, the community of mathematicians, the community that has been represented here during a large part of the week, a very large group that has come to answer them, but that, of course, assembles on the, on the daily basis all over the globe in all kinds of different configurations. And I think it's fair to say that in terms of scientific community, the community of mathematicians is really unusual in its generosity, in its openness, and in its general a generous interest in others. It really is a meritocracy, as pure as meritocracies can be. And mathematics, within the community of mathematicians, is not so much your table manners that it matters, it's not your friendliness that matters, your, your pleasantness to be interacted with, or whatever, it's simply the extent to which you are open to listen and ready to contribute. And that community of mathematicians globally, with so many thousands, tens of thousands of participants, is, I think, yet another enormous miracle, a miracle that we should applaud and cherish. And it is not hard at all to be accepted by a group of mathematicians, even if you are not a mathematician yourself. And I think that is now something you are about to experience over the drink that you so much deserve the speakers and the listeners equally. And while we are all looking forward to science next visit, hopefully again to this country, but let's be realistic here, uh, to Europe perhaps, uh, let's at least enjoy that perspective and let's also make sure that we engage in these conversations, these open conversations, the mathematicians are so famous for. And here I have some final word of advice for you. There is one opening sentence that will always get a mathematician going, wherever you go and wherever you are. And that is this particular thing. <laughs> so keep that in mind, and I can assure you, over a drink, whoever you talk to, if this is your opening question, you will get a reply that will lead you to listen, wonder, and learn. Thank you very much. to many non-mathematicians as well, politicians and, and all kinds of, of, of walks of life. And um, do you have uh, tips or suggestions for the, the fourth miracle being present here, how they convey the, the wonders of the first three miracles to non-mathematicians? I mean, I've seen you borrow some scientists from Belgium and France. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, but do you, do you have some suggestions for for? for well, um, first of all, what I think is extremely important to all of us, and this is, happens to be a, a, a timely topic, is to make sure we have the best possible mathematical education in the Netherlands. And I'm saying it not without reason, because just a few days ago, and many of you will know this, a report was released, uh, unfortunately documenting that the quality and the standards of mathematical education and elements have declined over the past few years. And I think this is a real issue and a real threat. So we should, first of all, we should start to make sure that we get back to the level we need and to make sure that we educate our young people to be at least interested and properly trained in mathematics that they're going to use. And secondly, if you have that kind of base competence cultural population, then they should be able to appreciate the beauty of these various miracles, and especially the applicability of mathematics. Because everybody who experiences that the first time will never forget it and will always appreciate it. Thank you so much. And so just, just before we get to the drinks, this very small time to see, I'd like to um, ask uh, a little shoulders uh, on stage. Big round of applause.